And so our co-sponsor for this meeting, Monsai Kim. Uh, Professor Kim is uh, both a theoretician, an experimentalist, and a modeler. What better to have as our first keynote speaker? Monsai. Hi, I'm Monsa Kim at the University of Texas, Austin. I'm pleased, very pleased to be here um, representing SAN, our team, uh, led by Brandon McLoy, Kimberly Neal, Miller, Robin Martin, and Leslie Shi. SAN is the Sediment Experimentalist Network. We are very happy to uh, help hold this meeting jointly with CSDNS. Thanks to the CSDNS, allow us to uh, part participate in here and also James. I'm pretty sure uh, this meeting will be a starting point to have a great synergy between the two committees and also a lot of uh, strong collaborations between the two committees as well. Sam, this means strong in Korean and you in Turkish. I present this at AGU uh, Gilbert Club, and everybody loves it, so I just need to use it again. And that means we want to build a strong community for you, experimentalists and modelers. SEN SEN represents Sediments Experimentalists Network, and it is NSF uh, sponsored EarthCube Research Coordination Network uh, projects. We aim to support our data enabled our community for experimental earth surface process uh, research. We have three different focus groups. First one is EC, is experimental collaboratories. The second one is ED, is education data standards. And third one is KB, is a uh, noun space. I want to go uh, further uh, more details about individual focus groups. First one is experimental collaboratories. We want to enhance more collaborations between the laboratories. We are always working alone. So even though we go, come to the Asia meetings and other international meetings, we talk with each other, share the ideas, but we never really collaborate with each other between the labs. So we want to enhance more collaborations. To do so, we want to develop some uh, infrastructures to uh, facilitate that, and we want to broadcast experiments and also address some community grant challenges together. Here is a, a screenshot, one of the YouTube live uh, video of one of the uh, Summer Institute's experiments in Kyle Strauss uh, location. And we also have a live experimental calendar that anybody can you know, sign up and just let other people know when you are conducting experiments uh, we broadcast uh, through the YouTube of the experiments and you watch it in your desktop. The second one is knowledge base. We want to develop online resources for experimental data management. One of the major things is uh, sedex.net, which is this, the screenshot. If you go to this website and browse into the, the data or setups, this is the one of the window that you can see. There are many uh, entries already. We, this is a forum for the user base information exchange, and also it has a lot of metadata practices and methods and um, laboratories information. We so far have 45 data entries, 26 setups, 18 methods, and 21 treatments, and 6 labs. So, I continuously getting uh, the questions from other people. Uh, how do you uh, make segment feeder? How do you construct the bloom? Where do you buy sediments? There is no common web-based uh, resources we can go and find. It. We want to serve that to the community through this ZX planet. Third one is EC. We want to develop and disseminate recommendations for the data practice and standards. 
one of the major outcomes we have done, we published a paper based on the inputs from the community and discussion through the many workshops and town hall meetings. We have uh, recently uh, published it in uh, Geomorphology, in uh, Binghamton Symposium, Special Volume. You can find a lot of uh, community challenges, strategies, and structural uh, scientific opportunities in the paper. We have done um, many workshops, including this one. This is our fourth workshop. Um, first one held in uh, UT Austin way ago, uh, 2012. And 2013, we went to Japan in Nagasaki University. And 2014, we went to uh, uh, Netherlands, Utrecht University, and had a workshop there. We really worked hard to gain more understanding what we need for the, the data management and how we share the data with the community. We also hold uh, uh, AGU town hall meetings between the 2012 to 2014 using the inputs and discussions and insight we gained so far for the last three years. We went to the school courses like the summer institutes and continuously educating young researchers. And we want to do continuously uh, doing that. In this EC, Education and Data Standards, there are two most significant challenges. One is data discoverability, and second is the data accessibility, something I'm going to talk about more. Because I'm so proud of all the workshops, including this one, I brought some pictures. The first one at UT, we conducted the experiments together. We uh, made a survey, you know, what the uh, participants want to conduct. And based on that, we change the parameters and conduct the experiments and uh, try to share through the web, based on the repository. We have a discussion, the uh, participants participated in the small experiments. We had a lot of fun. The second one in the Japan, Strato Dynamics was the, the name. The Tetsuji Muto and Hajime Naruse was the one who made this possible. And Brandon McMurray, one of our uh, PI, we worked so hard between the workshop place to the hotel. We need to uh, use the tram, the small train to get there. We always just fell in asleep because we worked so hard. This is the, the picture of we mixed the uh, solvent water to make a stability crunch. Third one, we went to the European country to make better, bigger uh, community, including European researchers. Uh, UREST was the one who made this possible. We went um, and conducted experiments in a Euro tank, made a like, very intense discussion in breakout groups. We learned a lot from the community. So we worked hard, and we've done a lot of things. But I didn't say why we need a uh, community a network like a sedimentary experimental network, SEN. I just want to briefly talk about data challenges in our community. I learned a few terms, new terms, uh, through this project. First one is dark data. Do you still have your lots of data in your external hard drive? Do you still don't know how to do it, how to share it through the web to share it with other people? Still, you send by email your hard drive to the different person. So, that data represents um, there's no accessible in the, uh, through the internet, but it's isolated. Second one is a big data. In my laboratory, with my students, we generate a, uh, image data uh, because we take the images uh, in a, a experiments. We generate a terabyte of data easily in you know, a one single experiment. And it takes a lot of space in the, uh, it's in the hard drive, of, of course. So managing this big data is the problem. And this is a challenge for our community. Also, search through the exact data set or exact data points we want to find in a big data is also the, the challenge. Third one is diverse data. This, our community, probably including the modeling community, it's an example community for the long tail data, which represents one of a kind experimental setup and also the isolated the experiments. I briefly mentioned about even between the experimentalists, our communication is quite low. 
we have a lack of communication. We talk, we don't know in other uh, experimental facility what kind of sediment feeder is used, what kind of grains are used, whether it is round or uh, shaped. We actually don't know exactly now, how we reproduce other experiments in my laboratory. Okay. So, quite a long um, tale, as, as you see here. And it's, our final one is acceptable data. The funding agency keeps asking you about data management plans. You need to prepare for that. And also, continuously, journals are asking. So, you, you were a uh, data associated with your paper. It's available on, online. Have we ready for that? We are ready. Are we ready for that? Do we have a tool for channels to resolve these problems? Here is the solution. One of the solutions comes to the clinic 2.1. The same provider our clinic take only measurements and leave only data. You will find a lot of insights we have gained for the last many years, and you will get this button as well. And we're going to uh, talk about best practices for data collection and management. We're going to talk about the life cycle of the data, metadata that we um, think is the best or optimal for right now, data preservation, discovery, Oops. and we use, and we also uh, talk about the workflow and cyber infrastructure is like a, uh, our uh, knowledge base and C and geosemantics and how we just use those to make uh, data repository. So please come. This is a short uh, time period, so I cannot uh, tell you all the, the good things we found, but if you come to the clinic, you will find. Switch the gears a little bit. I want to talk about the science, the scientific challenges. The SAN does not want to only give you a tool to manage data. We want to drive ourselves using great science. I think we want to plant the new culture to share the data and reuse and discover the existing data. But the best way to carry out is enhance our community, support our community to do the best science. So, I brought some grand challenges with them, and one of the great outcomes from the workshops in Nagasaki University. And you probably recognize this person. It's Gary Parker. He had me dance at the meeting along the Korean song. Here, it's playing. And then he showed us a great vision about Earthscape 2100. This is actually linked to the current theme for the CS Venus meeting. So, the imprints of climate change on the landscape and seascape. I'm going to give you a few examples of my own experiments and dealing with our own grand challenge in our experimental community about the repeatability, scalability, and also autogenic and allogenic processes to touch on this big picture topic. So this is one of the very small experiments uh, done in a, like less than one meter long and uh, 50 centimeter wide. But we did, we want to um, simulate Arctic Delta. So I bought a small ice machine, ice brush machine, and then students just put a cubed ice and crushed it and put it into a small uh, spoon and pack it and make an ice cover. And then put a water and brings the sediments from the one corner and building a delta. Okay. Since the ice is okay, you cannot see through it. We put a, a camera underneath of the, the film and watch what happens. On the left hand side, this is the no ice condition. So you can actually see no bit switching, but very frequently, and make a very smooth progradation to the old directions. However, when we run with the ice cover, about 5 to 7 centimeters, and run a, a delta experiment, you actually see pulses of delta toe progradation. There was a channel initiated by the interaction between the ice and the, uh, the water, and pushing 
the sediments into the one location and switch them to the different location. So it caused the very rough, uh, robust the delta tow line. After we drain the water, this is the picture from the top. On the right hand corner, at the center is the sediment source, and this is the uh, shoreline in blue, and then tow. And you can actually see the top set and four set. Especially four set, you could see using the ice cover, it's quite elongated to the downward, and also have a lot of rock topography. Just putting the ice, and that's doing the like, very similar experiments. However, it caused a very strong difference on the topography development. I was very excited about it. It was so obvious when I looked at the topography after we uh, melted the ice and looked at the topography. What happens was so clear to me. Because we oftentimes isolate one single a parameter to address in the experiments. And we also access in the time scale and the spatial scale, we cannot access in the natural system. So observation of the core processes through the experiments is easy and it produces a high resolution data to support ideas. So the channel underneath of the ice was very obvious. We could um, generate a like conceptual model of what happens in the experiments. However, if I write this paper with this data and then want to publish it, maybe you are one of the reviewers and say, okay, how do you feel it? Do you have any natural example? That would be the hurdle we have. All the experimentalists have this hurdle. How we can resolve this? In this particular uh, experiment, we luckily have some uh, the natural data in our Arctic Delta and our Mississippi River shows a quite different roughness on the surface of the four set. So, kind of, kind of like depends on you know, what we are uh, presenting. However, most of the experiments and their data and their research is have a big problem of uh, scale. Here's uh, one example. I wrote a few uh, papers using the experiments, but there's a pattern. When I, whenever I, I submit the paper, the reviewers say, scale, scale, scale. But this particular one, I didn't get any. Why? This is something I want to tell you, and I need moderator's help. On the left-hand side, it's just a very small tank and one-dimensional, very narrow, and put the sediments, but mixture to clear the delta. I use a quartz sand, which a proxy for the coarse uh, sediments, and walnut precious uh, sediments, proxy for fine sediments. And you can actually see the boundary between the white ones and brown color. There's the shoreline. The sea level is rising very slowly. This boundary between the coarse sediments and fine sediments is probably enough. Just, fo just following how the shoreline is probably enough. However, on the right hand side, I made a little bit of higher civilized rate. And see what happens. So on the right hand side, white ones, brown ones, it starts to show very similar pattern. However, over time, it starts to retreat. Grain size transition between the coarse material and fine material is already start to retreat. However, during that, this tool line is still prorated now. Okay? I made a set of experiments with different civilized weights and see how the pattern changes. Those are the grain size um, and proxy for the coarse, net, coarse uh, sediments and fine sediments in the natural systems. Um, always keep the same uh, sediment supply and water supply. Isolate the uh, experiments uh, parameters, but only look at the one, one single problem. In this particular paper, I wrote a course. Maybe, maybe I just stole a couple things from uh, Gary's ebook chapters and combined them to have maximum equations, the so sediment mass balance to calculate the sediment uh, transport and evolve the uh, surface, but have uh, three different moving boundaries. First one is gravel sand transition, which is E. 
and shoreline, which is the downstream boundary, and the delta tau. They're moving uh, with each other in this part of the sea level rise. However, I used the well-known sediment transfer relations for the Bravo and Sands for Parker 1979 uh, and also Angle and Hansen 1972. I ran a couple of test uh, modeling with a 2 millimeter, um, 2 millimeter per year sea level rise, 6 and 10 millimeter, and 10 millimeter in this particular case caused a retreat. That's the retreat of the um, grain size transition in, uh, compared to the shoreline. Shoreline is still prograding out, but in terms of the mass balance, it moves, the coarse material moves the mass and then starts to retreat. So it caused a very similar patterns um, between the modeling and the experiment. Okay, and then what I did? Oh, so this is the why, why, why it happens. In terms of the geometry, if I just cut this in focus, sea level rise is that much. Because of the toxic slope, grain size transition actually has additional sea level rise. So it returns to the uh, faster sea level rise, starts to retreat much earlier. Traditional progradation uh, power sequence that shows progradation uniform, but that might not be correct because of this uh, experience. This is a trick that I made to scale and didn't get any review points of the uh, uh, scale of the experiments. I calculated the slope phase in the sediment transfer empirical relationship in the experiment and then plug that empirical relationship into the existing model. Replace the Parker Settle 1979 and Angular and Hansen. And it produced the exactly the same patterns like this. So it captures both the natural system and an experimental system. I could do very simple uh, modeling, but you can do much better, right? Coming back to this, the um, zigzag lines you uh, remember? This is the autogenic processes. I can talk more about these autogenic uh, processes, but I want to emphasize it shows the systematic changes. Magnitudes and frequencies are changing by sea level rise rate. If the sea level rise rate is high, you have a smaller standard deviation. The small cause large standard deviation. So it works as a signature. We all thought autogenic processes and its stratigraphic patterns is coming from noise. But I can think of this from the noise. We need to understand this. Mothers need to model internal dynamics and stratigraphic signatures to understand the climate changes and the, the weathers. So I view allogenic as a climate change and autogenic as a weather. We have a lot of um, opportunities to understand the systems, sedimentary systems, using autogenic processes. My clock shows eight minutes. Yeah. Okay. So this is the conclusion. So we have grand challenges in our community. We need to know how to produce someone else's experiments. And we need to know how to scale our experiments. We need to know how to understand autogenic signatures and allogenic signatures. Using only experiments, among the experimental lists, it may take longer. However, if we make a joint effort, modelers and experimentalists you know, work together, we probably can advance our science much, much in the best way. We, you saw the examples, but this is only few the solutions we have in our community. You probably already have a much better ideas in your head already. So, join the efforts. Thank you very much.
the microphone needs to be turned on. So, questions. Who would like to go first? We have questions and mics. Uh, just stand up, go to one of those mics, and I'm sure one's are Kim or anyone from the experimentalist would ask a question. Mary? Hi. Hello. Hi, really nice talk. Um, uh, so from a modeling viewpoint, what I emphasize a lot, which people know, is sensitivity analysis and that um, um, with really simple models, you can kind of understand the dynamics, but when things get complicated, you can't. And so I was just, just going to mention that in some of the modeling you do, um, uh, showing how things match is great, and, but, but digging into why did I match? What was important? What did I did I have to change anything? Did I have to calibrate? And and what really dominated that is is really of interest to me at least. In the, and I thought it, I just mentioned it in connection with your work as well. Thank you. And we often actually come into the complicated the problem first. So, but what I learned uh, so far, whenever I want to copy the nature, I fail. But if I know how to simplify it, I kind of learn the things. And from the simplifying things, we can actually step. And based on the, the, the basic uh, findings, we can add more complicated things. So that, I think, would be uh, one of the good strategies. Another question. So let's, well, I'll ask Gwen to continue this. So, so you know, the sediment, uh, sediment experimentalists, they're, uh, they are, um, how, they, they provide the appearance, at least, of being uh, worried about scaling. And you mentioned it. But why do you think that is? Actually, personally, I don't know why. <laughs> because if I use computer model, then I think, oh, I doubt one, one more time whether it is real or not. But if I run water and sediments, this is real, isn't it? We're doing a science. But I know why the reviewers and also the community are concerned about it because we are doing just science. We want to apply our insight into the natural system. And we want to understand first, right? So I think it is a valuable point to know how to scale. But however, I always think what we learn from the laboratory experiments is it, it has its own meaning. And it's based on the physics. And oftentimes, we collaborate with like a chemistry, right? So it's, again, it's nature. and. I think it's uh, one of the small scale. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not in your community, but I wouldn't be too worried about problems. But, you know, because modelers scale all the time. In fact, if it's a good model, it's already scaled. So um, scaling is just the very nature of how we do our business in the modeling world. It should be the very nature of uh, how you do your business. So I shouldn't be so sensitive, but Tom, This is the point. A question here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's important because there's been community about, um, like, I work more at a very small scale of processes, and I think that should connect more to bigger scale experiments because we give the scale in general. So, for example, if somebody do a very small experiment on the center of highs, they should. Um, Water interaction with sediment and like that, that should culminate 
coming to keep more because then I say, well, maybe you should buy a temperature of this or by content of sand versus ice that way to have a more systematic approach in the sense of getting the sensitivity of, oh, okay, I've heard this, this specific thing, I know that that will do this very small scrap point, and maybe that helps to go. I, I understand that it cannot do many, many experiments when you have more complicated system, but uh, if you know you just very to do three points, it's three different high content, but you know that that's, that's the scale which matters the most, then, then you have some you know, guidance. That's mm -hmm. Internal discussion. <laughs> How do we convince more people to take their data from the dark side to the good side or the light side? So this is, yes, this is one of the major things we have worked on. Um, we need credit, right? But sometimes you try to publish it with the data and you fail because of the scaling problem. <laughs> but still, the data will be useful. Maybe someone else will be reused. But it should be discoverable, right? So, for example, there are C, um, like NSF uh, supported large uh, data repository, can hold your data. And also, once you publish it, you get the UI. So it's citable. In that way, you can get some credit. And in SEN, probably Brandon can uh, speak about this. We would like to create experimentalist data publication. So only the data, the fine data, with a, met a good metadata, can publish through that uh, channel and get uh, citations and so on. So the authors can credit out of it. So I think this is the, one of the ways we can increase the users. Uh, experimentalists make their doc data to the white tape. Right there? I don't know why it's done. So let's thank Juan Sutkid one last time.